Our next speaker in, um, is uh, Priti Kanakamadela, um, who um, curated the, uh, the show on Brooklyn Abolition uh, at the Brooklyn Historic. And so, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the officer, uh, the office rather, of Senator um, Hamilton um, and the staff there for inviting me, and also to um, very well respected public historian Kathleen Hulster um, for telling me to check my email. <laughs> email for me. Um, uh, my name is Preeti Kanakamedala. Um, I am an assistant professor at Bronx Community College, CUNY, uh, so very much part of the CUNY family. Um, and in a formal life, and in, indeed in this one too, um, I'm very much a public historian. Uh, I worked for five years at the Brooklyn Historical Society on a project called In Pursuit of Freedom, which was dedicated to telling the story of abolitionism in Brooklyn, um, to talk about anti-slavery activity and the anti-slavery movement as it occurred here in the borough. Um, and I want to say before I sort of go on my research, um, historians and researchers, we build on the work of other people. Um, and we do so constantly. So um, this project very much came out of decades of research and work by uh, community activists, organizers, scholars who had come before me, uh, one of whom, of course, is Joan Maynard uh, at Weeksville Heritage Center. And the other one, uh, Joy Chattel at um, Duffy Old Houses, now called Abolitionist Place, because of the kind of activism that they were doing. Um, so I came on board to a project called In Pursuit of Freedom, which began uh, for myself in 2010. And it brought together three uh, cultural institutions right here in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Historical Society up in Brooklyn Heights, Weeksville Heritage Center out on the border of uh, Crown Heights Bed-Stuy, depending on who claims it, um, and uh, Iondell Ensemble Project over in Fort Greene. Um, and I was told, basically, that the remit was wide open, that I could do whatever I wanted, but that we had to launch three exhibits, a K-12 curricula to get it into the schools, a theater production and walking tours that really told the history of Brooklyn and abolitionism. Um, and if you are a New York City historian or you know New York City's history, a lot of people claim to be historians of this city, but what they're really talking about is Manhattan, often. Um, so when I came on board the project, it was a twofold um, job, really. It was telling the history of Brooklyn and staying true to the history of Brooklyn, but also trying to find the voices of those people that had built Brooklyn and weren't necessarily dominant in the archives. The exhibit is up today, um, and I would urge you to all go see it, but I'll come back to that. When I began the project, um, in Brooklyn Heights, if you've ever been to Cabin Plaza, downtown Brooklyn, there is a very prominent statue of Henry Ward Beecher, who is perhaps still uh, the more famous face of the abolitionist movement here in Brooklyn. Um, he was the pastor at Plymouth Church. Um, and I was really interested, both as a historian and a woman of color, in thinking about the ways in which archives don't necessarily capture the voices of the people who did the work. So while we have this beautiful um, memorial of Henry Ward Beecher and his activities in Brooklyn, it really took a village of us to figure out how we were going to tell the story of people of color, and specifically women of color, who were actually at the forefront of the anti-slavery movement. And so we dug into the archives, and we didn't just stay at Brooklyn Historical Society. Um, our colleagues at Weeksville Heritage Center were hugely influential. They pioneered um, some of the things that we sort of built upon. Um, but we also went to the Schomburg. We went outside of New York City. We went to look at the um, anti-slavery petitions in the National Archives down in DC. And each time we found it was another person of color that had been building Brooklyn at a time in this nation's history when Brooklyn was actually the largest slave-holding county in New York State. So during the gradual emancipation period, which is from 1799 to 1827, Brooklyn abolitionists, mainly people of color, were living right here in Brooklyn, right before West Elm goes into sort of Dumbo. It is a thriving community of free black people 
who are really pushing social justice and thinking about what democracy means in the United States. Two of them were brothers, Peter and Benjamin Kroger, and they were sort of at the center um, of the anti-slavery movement. We know of their names because the archives kept them. They are founders of the Brooklyn African Woman Benevolent Society. They are founders of what is today Bridge Street AWME. Um, and they build one of the first schools, it's a private school um, that no longer exists, right? They raised it, talking about erasure and memory. Uh, they raised it when they, when they built, rather, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and what I was really interested in was thinking about the women that were probably fighting social justice alongside these two brothers, Peter and Benjamin Kroger. And what's so interesting is, it's that silence of the archives that historians talk about constantly. Um, we know Peter was married to a woman called Phoebe, and we know Benjamin was married to a woman called Eleanor, right? The census records tell us that. But what Phoebe and Eleanor were doing in Brooklyn at that time still remains that kind of historian mystery that I wish I could get to the bottom of. But as the decades roll along, um, and this is just one of the many stills from the exhibit, which is still up at Brooklyn Historical Society, Women of color really do start to appear in the archives, and I sort of loathe the term, um, they were somehow hidden, or they're, um, you know, they are uh, rediscovered. I think part of the problem is, is it begins with the archives. I think they always exist in the archives. I just think the way in which we look at the archives and the way in which the archives are collected becomes part of the problem. Um, and so by the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, we have a huge number of black women who are very much at the forefront of Brooklyn's abolition movement. They are working, not just as local um, pioneers, but they're working very much in the national story. It's again the way in which we tell our stories. One of them, um, I'll come back to Marincha, um, one of them is Elizabeth Gloucester. Elizabeth Gloucester was the wife of James Gloucester, his father, course, is the founder of Black Presbyterianism, um, and she moves here from Philadelphia with her husband in the 1840s. Um, again, it's how you read the archive. She could just remain the wife of James Gloucester, but actually, Elizabeth Gloucester was radical in the type of activities she was doing. Um, this letter has been at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania for decades. Um, and it's kind of sat in the archives, and it wasn't until we made the connection that we realized Elizabeth is one of the many, many people who actually give John Brown, a much more famous abolitionist, in cultural memory anyway, $10 to go raid Harper's Ferry, right? John Brown had stayed with the couple here in Brooklyn, and then he had gone up to Frederick Douglass's home. And Elizabeth says, and I'll paraphrase, um, Elizabeth basically says, I'm not coming with you on the suicide mission to Harpers Ferry, you go do it, but here is $10 to help you with the cause. And she talks about feeling very dejected about the way in which democracy and social justice looked in the United States in the 1850s. And so this letter is written in August 1859, and of course, um, John Brown goes in October, um, and is dead by December. So I do think there is a lot to be said about thinking of Brooklyn not just as a sort of local history, um, and of course when we think of Weeksville, if you start thinking about that local history as actually being part of our national history, in which women of color were very much pioneers and very much at the forefront, constantly pushing the agenda of what it meant to be an American and what it meant for social justice and democracy. Um, I hope you have a chance to go to Brooklyn Historical Society, and our sister exhibit is at Weeksville Heritage Center, which I'm sure Senzali will talk a bit more about. But um, uh, it has been up since 2014, and it will be up until next year. It is a long-term permanent exhibit. Um, it tells the story both of Brooklyn's history, its growth from a small village, or just one of six towns in Kings County, and how it becomes the third largest city in the United States by 1860 probably because it is building its money on the slave economy and sugar. In the middle, um, we encourage, because this is an activist exhibit, we encourage um, visitors to very much touch things and pull on things. And so, um, you can see some pulleys in front of uh, Maritza Lyons, and if you pull on them, uh, it will start to reveal her story um, and talk about 
various themes that I think are so, so relevant to today. Um, what does community look like when we think about freedom? What does safety look like? Um, what does education look like? Um, and we also have a website, if you can't make it down to Brooklyn Historical Society, it is pursuitoffreedom.org. Uh, and I would actually say it tells a far more comprehensive and expansive story um, of the project and of the histories that were found. Um, and so yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd like to ask them. because women are not archivists, because they're not running the programs? What do you think the role of women inside of, I guess, museums or archives are in us being able to sort of interpret them through a feminine lens or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, certainly, uh, Brooklyn Historical Society is founded in 1863. It's a gentleman's club. Um, and they're very much dedicated to preserving the history of Brooklyn through a very specific lens. Right? So when we're looking for um, people of color, women of color, social history, you are really digging in that archive. And I think you're absolutely right, right? It's changing. The people who are making those decisions at the head of repositories and the head of the archives now, with it changing, hopefully, the way in which we collect history, and therefore those people that come to the table to interpret that history also changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, uh, we would like to ask uh, one of our distinguished academicians, Dr. Evelyn Castro, to address the audience and the presenters. say good afternoon to everyone. This has been a rich weekend for us. I don't know if Dr. Brenda Green has spoken yet. Have you spoken? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we were with her yesterday uh, for the 100th anniversary of Gwendolyn Brooks. And what a wonderful, rich uh, intellectual conversation it was to hear the readings and to think about Gwendolyn Brooks and, and her work and a, a woman's perspective on history and activism. What you probably don't know, my role here now is I came with Dr. Crew to really start the pipeline. I had been the Dean of Liberal Arts here before, and now I'm the Dean of the School of Professional and Community Development, which very proudly uh, houses uh, the Center for Law and Social Justice, as well as the Center for Black Literature, the Caribbean Research Center, and 20 youth programs. The concept is, in order to get students into the college, we have to blanket Central Brooklyn. And if you know anything about the governor's push now, Central Brooklyn certainly needs all of the support academically, socially, in every way for our students to realize their full potential. When Alexei, our chief librarian, uh, Polonov, asked me to be here today, and he has done so much to further the study of, of students here in Central Brooklyn. I think you should give him a round of applause. <laughs> he welcomes every meaningful exhibit. So when I knew this was happening, I said, no matter what, church and everything else, I have to be here. What the Weeksville people don't know is that in 1970, I was a first grade teacher at the Weeksville School, but it was called Isaac Newton. And I took my kids across the street to dig in the dirt and we found some of those artifacts, which then Joe Maynard and the architects and everyone else took to the Historical Society and to the Landmark Commission. <laughs> and it was great scouts and children from the Isaac Newton School. So those children in the Isaac Newton School, PS 243, reclaimed their history. And we really looked at Brooklyn and what was happening. As time went on, I was able to work with Jacob Morris, who uh, I got called into the New York Historical Society to be a consultant because how do children really learn and understand their history? 
at the Weeksville School, we had to do all kinds of tactile things, making butter, you know. How did they look? How did they make that travel from the Brooklyn waterfront all the way to central Brooklyn safety in a safe way because they were in harm's way as they made their way. There was no buses or trains for them. How did they uh, extract ink, black ink, from, from uh, whales and fish so that they could actually write and create their very structured societies? So I was happy at a point to serve on the Weeks School Board, right? And everything is, is connected because we are still discovering our history. Imagine if the girls and women, the young women today, knew about hidden figures, knew about the mathematicians that were part of their history, not only in Africa, but, it, but here. So I am emboldened just by being here today, by seeing all of you here in your rightful place at Megar Evers College as we discover our history and we continue to enlighten everyone around us, especially the young children. And I'm glad to be with Jacob again. Jake, Jacob is a fighter, always fighting to rename things and change things. And I think our work at the Historical Society, his work in particular in the New York Historical Society and structuring that exhibit was monumental. And I was glad to be part of it. All right. So congratulations to all of you for taking part of your Sunday to be here and bring more people, bring more people because we have to keep discovering our history and celebrating ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Castro. This is a... Uh, um, it's great to be here, and I want to bring, uh, bring together, we have a bit of a theme right now of some of the resources available, both to academics and to the general public, So, um, uh, which is part of the Brooklyn Historic Society uh, in Weeksville, as well as the Brooklyn Collection in, uh, at the uh, Brooklyn Public Library. So I'd like to introduce uh, Natiba Guy Clement. Manager of Special Collections at the Brooklyn Public Library's Brooklyn Collection. I am very new to the position. I started in December um, and I'm coming from the Schaumburg Center uh, where I spent quite a considerable amount of time there um, and consider it my home away from home. I am not a historian but I do have a love for facts, real facts, not alternative <laughs> ones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the telling of stories and history and learning and the care of and sharing of historical documents. So, uh, the Brooklyn Collection is Brooklyn Public Library's only archive and special collection. We are the local history division of the Brooklyn Public Library. It was founded in 1997 as a small book collection attached to the library's history division. And our goal there is to document the history of Brooklyn from pre-colonial times to the present. Our collections serve to bear witness to the ongoing life of this vital community, and we share Brooklyn's rich heritage through our exhibitions, programming, and outreach efforts. Our collection strengths are the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. <laughs> so that is basically the seed of our collection. We acquired the morgue in 1957, and it contains millions of newspaper clippings, uh, as well as about 50,000 photographs of Brooklyn and another 150,000 of non-Brooklyn subjects. Uh, we also own the entire Eagle Run from 1841 to 1955 on microphone, as well as other peripheral materials, including publications and memorabilia. So we serve a wide range of patrons. Um, we collect materials that are suitable for all ages. Um, but our emphasis is on adult materials and uh, as well as collecting uh, material for our Brooklyn Connection School Outreach Program, which reaches middle and high school students. So we're at the Central Library at 10 Grand Army Plaza, in case anybody wants to come by and visit. I would appreciate it. <laughs> so, women formed a central part of the abolitionist movement in the years that led up to the Civil War and during wartime. 
They participated in many varied ways, from writing and giving speeches, becoming conductors of the Underground Railroad, and by assisting Union soldiers by organizing sanitary fairs around the country. Uh, the idea of hidden histories is very appropriate and very timely, and today I'd like to highlight one hidden history in particular. And the role she played wasn't necessarily uh, one that was, you know, I don't want to say super practical, but really that's, that's what I mean. It was more of a passive role that she played in the abolitionist movement. And it's a role that gave her no agency that she took on as an enslaved girl at the age of nine. So, I know uh, Reverend Beecher was mentioned, and he is, you know, one of the kind of pioneers of the abolitionist movement in Brooklyn. So the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights and its Reverend Henry Ward Beecher would often use enslaved girls as characters during his sermons, where he would imp impersonate an auctioneer and ask the congregation for offerings to purchase enslaved persons' freedom. His emotional and dramatic speeches would encourage the audience into tossing money and jewelry into collection plates. And there were several girls and young women that were subjects of these auctions. So the one of most renowned is that of Sally Maria Diggs. She was an enslaved nine-year-old child who was also known as Pink or Pinky due to her fair complexion. Sally was born into slavery. Her mother and two brothers were sold by their owners to the state of Virginia, and she and her grandmother were sold to a slave owner in Baltimore. Her grandmother was able to secure freedom for herself, but not for Sally. And because of this, she enlisted the help of Reverend Beecher to help to secure her granddaughter's freedom. So on February 6, 1860, during an auction service at Plymouth Church, led by Reverend Beecher, 1100 in money and jewelry was raised to buy Sally's freedom. Reverend Beecher returned all the jewelry with the exception of a large fire opal ring. And at the end of the auction, he baptized Sally and gave her the name Rose Ward, after Rose Terry who was a poet who put the ring in the collection plate. And he gave her the name Ward, which was also his last name. He placed the ring on Sally's hand, saying, with this ring, I do wed thee to freedom. So, sorry. So that, the photo on the left, is a, is a portrait that was done of Sally um, with the ring that she received from her auction. And on the right, it's a bill of sale. Um, these are items that are in our collection. So this act like, uh, and others like it moved Beecher's congregation and gave them a glimpse of enslavement and the horrors of the auction. However, to others, it was viewed as typical theatrics. So this is a, a right. So this is an article from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle um, that spoke of the incident at the church. <laughs> uh, Brooklyn Daily Eagle blurb in the city news and gossip section stated rather drolly, a curious effect, a people made generous through circumstances. It has been ascertained that those who so freely offered and liberally gave their money for the purchase of the little slave girl at Mr. Beecher's church wore Gaston's hat, singular if true. So I was curious, what, what was the significance of Gaston? Was Gaston. So Gaston refers to Gaston Hatters, and they were located on uh, Fulton Street. So they also placed a lot of ads in the paper during that time, and this was like their version of uh, social media, right? They were like tying themselves to something that was happening at the time. Gaston Town. Gaston So after her auction, Sally Maria Diggs, now known as Rose Ward, slipped away into anonymity. She lived in Brooklyn with the family of another reverend for a short time, and then returned to live with her grandmother in Washington, D.C. She was educated at the Howard University Normal School, where she was rediscovered by the new pastor of the Plymouth Church, Dr. James Stanley Durkin. She became a teacher and married a Washington lawyer named James Hunt, and it was now Rose Ward Hunt. She started her family and lived a quiet life. Dr. Durkee contacted and arranged to have Mrs. Hunt join the Plymouth Church at its 80th anniversary celebration and commemorate the day that she was freed at auction. Wow. However, the headline on the May 11, 1927 Brooklyn Daily Eagle spoke to Mrs. Hunt's reservations regarding reliving that moment and making the trip back to the Plymouth Church.
The article went on to state, Today on the eve of her departure for Brooklyn to attend the 80th anniversary celebration of the church that took her out of bondage, she has gone into semi-retirement and is denying herself of all comers. Her husband, a gray-haired Negro lawyer, answers the doorbell and politely but firmly explains that his wife is, n is no longer giving interviews on the pinky episode of So Long Ago. When pressed further about his wife's upcoming visit to the church, Mr. Hunt explained that his wife had nothing to say about the trip and added that she barely remembered the episode at the church but had certain associations that kept it from fading from her mind. This spoke to the frame of mind of a nine-year-old who was being put in front of a packed crowd at the Plymouth Church and with an uncertain fate. Mr. Hunt did continue to state that there were lots of mistakes in the published reports of how Pinky was found, but that he would not undertake to correct them. In the end, the article summed up the entire encounter with the Hunt family in the most accurate way. At the Hunt home, the impression was gathered that these Negroes did not, re did not enjoy recalling the slave auction of 1860 at Plymouth Church. Hunt himself would discuss his wife's part in it only with the greatest reluctance. Mrs. Hunt did visit the Plymouth Church in 1927 at the church's 80th anniversary, wow. where she sat beside, beside Reverend Durkee during the, the sermon. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle covered the story of her visit, her speech to the congregation, and the thousands that turned out to see the infamous Pinky. It also featured the unfortunate byline, former slave girl greeted by thousands, regret she did not make more of her life. Yeah, wow. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> While at the church, Mrs. Hunt visit, visited the bronze statue of Henry Ward Beecher in the church garden. This statue was produced by sculpt, famed sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who later created the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. And of interest to note, he was also a member of the clan. So. Mrs. Hunt was described several times as being humble or trembling nervously clearly overwhelmed by the amount of attention she received. Mrs. Hunt told her story that day and spoke of her recollection of the auction and the one thing that stood out in her memory. It was the story of a comb she wore in her hair that Reverend Beecher had her remove. As he told her, my child, never wear anything in your hair other than what God put there. According to Mrs. Hunt, all of the incidents in her story were repeated to her by others and felt like they were not her own recollection. Uh, also of interest to note, the recording of, there's a recording of Mrs. Hunt's speech at the church at the Brooklyn Historical Society, which I haven't listened to, but I would love to go. <laughs> In the rest of her speech, Mrs. Hunt thanked the Plymouth Church and Reverend Beecher for their Christ-like work, love, understanding, and compassion, and for their work in securing the freedom of the enslaved. She thanked them for giving her a good start to citizenship and for the gift of educa education. She also spoke on the fact that her mother and siblings remained enslaved and were not seen by her again, and expressed her gratitude to the church that allowed her to escape the same fate. I am glad of this opportunity to publicly acknowledge that I have always had a feeling of deep love and gratitude towards the church, whose congregation did so much for me. These agents of the Almighty snatched me from a fate that can only be imagined never known as my dear mother and brothers have not been heard of by any of our family since that separation 67 years ago. She spoke to her optimism for the future and mentioned that she would probably not visit the Plymouth Church or Brooklyn again. And the Eagle article stated that she lost the ring that Beecher gave her, but according to the Plymouth Church's website, they have the ring and a copy of her um, bill of sale on view. I'm not sure if it's the actual ring or if it's a replica or what the story is behind it, but I'm also interested in finding that out. One year after her visit to the Plymouth Church, Mrs. Hunt passed away in Washington, D.C. after a serious operation and a week of being ill. She was commemorated in the form of a portrait of her as Pinky the Slave Child with Reverend Beecher that was painted by artist Henry Roseland. 
The funds for the portrait was secured by the Negro citizens of Brooklyn. It was presented to the church in a special service. In part, the Eagle article described the occasion as, it was the white hands of the members of Plymouth Church that sent Pinky into the world free, eventually to attend college, teach, and marry happily. Dark hands are sending her back. Now, the story of Sally Maria Diggs, a.k.a. Pinky, a.k.a. Rose Ward, a.k.a. Rose Ward Hunt, is not necessarily the typical take on a role played by a woman in the fight against abolition. She was not a willing participant or an adult at the time. As a child, she was put in a position that persuaded others to take note of the horrors of enslavement and encourage them to react. Was this the best solution or way to persuasion? Absolutely not. But was it effective in getting people's attention? Unfortunately, yes. Did it remain vividly in the minds of those who witnessed it? Yes, apparently so. Uh, if you guys can take a look at the article on the left, uh, this is an interview with a Miss Hattie Clark, Hattie Clark Smith, uh, and she was, you know, had memories, fond memories and recollections of old Brooklyn, and she recalled that the biggest thrill of her life at 92 was seeing the auction at Plymouth Church. Did it become a part of Plymouth Church and River Beach's history? Yes, it did. The article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle described the auction as Plymouth's great greatest day. There are so many more questions that can be raised about this episode in history, Mrs. Hunt and her part in Brooklyn's abolition story. It's definitely one that deserves to be known and understood, and I, for one, look forward to finding out a little bit more about this woman.